right, welcome to this episode of our show, True Data Ops. I'm your host, Kent Graziano, the Data Warrior. In each episode, we bring you a podcast covering all things data ops with the people that are making data ops what it is today. If you've not yet done so, please be sure to find and subscribe to the True Data, sorry, to the DataOps.live YouTube channel. That's where you're going to find all the recordings for our past episodes. There's a QR code on your screen right now for that. And if you missed any of our earlier episodes, you know, this is your chance to, to catch up. Now, uh, another option, of course, is you can go to truedataops.org and just subscribe to the podcast. And that QR code is up there, too. Then you'll be sure to get all the notifications of who our upcoming speakers are going to be and when we're going to be broadcasting. So those things will help you out if you want to keep track of what we're doing. So today, my guest is Matt Aslett, who's the VP and Research Director for Ventana Research. And they just released a brand new Data Ops Buyer's Guide, which we're going to discuss a little bit in our show today. Welcome to the show, Matt. Hi, Ken. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So um, for folks who don't know you very well, um, you know, tell us a little bit about your background in data management and a little bit about what you do there at uh, Ventana. Sure. So I've been uh, an industry analyst covering um, analytics, predominantly data, um, since 2007. Uh, for most of that time, I was, I was at 451 Research and a couple of years at S&P Global after it acquired 451. And then for the past two years, I've been uh, part of the analytics and data practice at, at Ventana Research, um, which was actually just um, about a month and a half ago acquired by ISG. So, uh, you know, we keep moving onwards and upwards and, uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, increased in investment and expanding what we do. Um, anyway, throughout that time, you know, I've been involved in, in research and analysis and providing advisory to clients on, on data and then, you know, a number of areas in particular over the years, things like uh, NoSQL, NewSQL, distributed SQL databases, Hadoop, cloud databases, and sort of data management, data governance, data streaming, uh, and of course, most recently, uh, a lot of focus on data ops. Oh, great! Yeah, so you've 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 been through it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, gray hairs to prove it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The last twenty years has definitely uh, uh, added added a few of those to most of us. <laughs> Just keeping up with the terminology. Is, is exactly to, yeah. to, to turn your gray yeah and, and sure. you you're having to do that especially if you're you know writing these research papers and trying it's like okay what are we calling it today right exactly yeah <laughs> so uh before we jump into the report uh can you give give us your perspective on data ops you know what it is and how does it really fit in the evolving data landscape yeah i, I you know it's something obviously been tracking for, for for quite a while, um, and have seen you know an increased number of organisations taking a you know a, paying attention to it and and taking it up you know as a methodology and processes and you know we really see it on as a as a methodology for the delivery of agile business intelligence and data science and and to some extent operational data focused pr primarily through the automation and orchestration of data integration and data processing pipelines. But also incorporating things like improved data reliability and integrity through data monitoring um, and observability. And I think, you know, that casts a pretty wide net. So especially in relation to the report, which I can go and talk to more detail. But, you know, we were very, uh, we, we tried to focus there on really the practical application of things like agile development, DevOps, lean manufacturing to the tasks and skills that, you know, employed by data engineering professionals in support of data analytics and, and development and operations. So emphasizing things like continuous delivery of analytic insight, process simplification, automation. Um, and, and, you know, the, 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 the buyer's guides are designed to reflect a, a real world sort of RFI, RFP process for, the, you know, we put our, ourselves in the shoes of, of an organization evaluating products on, on functionality. So that, that gave us a, a kind of a list of things that we look at in terms of capabilities. But we also look at things like reliability and manageability and sort of the viability of the vendor and, and also how they can help organizations think about costs and, and TCO. So, you know, those are some of the things we're thinking about. But when we looked at data ops, we, we eventually sort of looked at a specific set of capabilities. And those were agile and collaborative 
um, uh, uh, for, for, for agile and collaborative data operations. So the development and testing of data and analytics pipelines, data orchestration and data observability. And those are the three sort of key reports. And then we had the overall data ops report. So there's actually, there was one sort of research project and then four products, that, uh, reports that came out of that. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like you, you named off uh, most of our seven pillars of true data ops in the process of describing everything yeah. you just described, which is great. Glad to, glad to see that, that, you know, that was the, the seven pillars were designed to be kind of a conceptual framework. And sounds like you took kind of the same approach with your, your research, which is, which is awesome. Right. It's like, yeah, it's like figure, let's figure out what problem we're trying to solve and what, what kind of features and capabilities do we need before we get down to, you know, actual technical details? Exactly. Yeah. 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 It is, it is very much a, a philosophical, just like agile, right. And DevOps, there's a lot of philosophical and process oriented uh, things that are involved there. It's not just technology. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine used to say, you know, uh, a, a, a bad architect with a good tool is still a bad architect. And likewise, a good architect with a bad tool is still a good architect. It just uh, you've got you got to get the two to meet in the middle there somewhere. Right. right? Good process, good technology together. So in, in the report, and I'm going to quote from your report here, you say we assert that by 2026, so that's really all just barely two years from now, uh, three quarters of organizations will adopt data engineering processes that span data integration transformation and preparation, producing repeatable data pipelines that create more agile information architectures. So you know, it was like the big question there is like, what led to that conclusion that, you know, 75% of organizations are going to adopt this by 2026? Yeah, I think, you know, I suppose that a slight caveat to that is not like that 75% won't exclusively necessarily be adopting those processes, but we do see, you know, this is a slow progress. As I say, I think, you know, DevOps has been around for many years. We've seen an increased number of organizations that are using it. They're still using it, you know, today, perhaps in, in certain pockets of the organization alongside more traditional approaches. But generally, you know, I've seen, you observe this movement towards data engineering process that support agility and continuous data processing. Um, you know, whereas sort of more traditional approaches and tools tended towards an assumption that data pipelines are, are linear. You know, you, you take data from right. these sources, you integrate it, transform it, and you deliver it over here, and then you're done. I think, you know, we see this, this greater focus from engineering organizations on continuous operations, that, and that's when, you know, then the focus becomes much more on things like repeatability and automation. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, the, the, the pillars, definitely when we were looking at, well, what are the key criteria for, for products in this space? You know, we looked at the, those pillars, we looked at the Data Ops Manifesto, and we tried to reflect those organizational and cultural changes um, that are driving interest in those products and services, in addition to obviously just the features and functionality, do, you know, um, so because we do think that is it, it, it is it's philosophically important, but I think it's it's it is truly important in differentiating these products and the data ops pro products that address data ops from more traditional data management products. Yeah, and I, I guess you know it's it, it it's hard to remember that you know it's only been a couple of decades. And you talk about traditional data management processes <laughs> that yeah we had. A data warehouse and it was ETL and it ran initially when I first started doing data warehousing, we ran it like once a month, right? And we we're right. pre aggregating all the data and scrubbing all the data and then just plop, there it is. We can do some reports. And then we got to going like uh, trying to run it once a week. So it was running over the weekend, right? And you, could, you couldn't run it during the week because everything else would come to a crawl. And then we eventually got to, okay, we can run it once every 24 hours, still running it in an overnight window. And now with the expansion, especially with the cloud, you know, and the availability of cheaper storage, cheaper compute, on demand, all of that. Now we've got stuff coming from all over the place all day long. And analytics is no longer, well, let's just look in the rearview mirror and try to project a couple of things. We, we want to know, like, what's happening now? And can yeah. we make adjustments right now? And that's 
sort of change the whole face of this. Like you said, it's like, you've got to have a different, different approach. It's not even, not even just agile anymore, right? Agile development process definitely needed, but the continuous integration ideas, CICD, the repeatability, the monitoring, the observability, all of that is like just exploded here. Like probably, you know, last five years, I think. Yeah, I think there's been a significant, to, well, for, you know, just observing. There does seem to have been an uplift in the last five years in particular. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so do you think it's even possible these days to for companies to really deliver value from all their data at this kind of scale if they're not, you know, adopting some agile data ops sort of approach or mindset? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it, obviously, it's certainly possible to, to deliver value from data without necessarily adopting data ops but i think you know you mentioned at scale i think that's that's the key yeah. point here you know the volumes of data that modern organizations are trying to make use of and then you know the number of different applications and sources and projects and the number of users you know when we talk about organizations being data driven and and having you know self-service access to data that that changes again completely in terms of the expectations of of the output and the scale of of the number of uh, of users so you know that's where repeatability and automation come into play, uh, as you say, and 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 I think you know if you're talking about that large scale, you know level of of initiative or, or, or project, then you know it, it's certainly it's increasingly difficult to deliver the value expected from that data without you know a data ops approach. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know it's been what is it two decades or so since we came up with this term big data. And now that's like, you know, uh, Claudia Imhoff used to say, it's still just data, right? Right. And, you know, and, and, you know, people started conflating that term with the technology. But today, with all of the sources, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, all this data off of mobile devices, edge devices, IoT, it, it's, it is, it's, it's not even big, isn't even the right word anymore, right? It's, it's, it's massive. It's massive. Mm. Uh, there was yeah. a research from IDC a couple of years back where they were predicting like 75 zettabytes of data. I think it was by 2025, if I remember the report right. And it's like, that's just, that's so many zeros. I don't even know how many zeros that is of how much data that is. Um, the even smaller operators are having to deal with data at scale. Yeah. Right. Where, where they may have never thought they were, you know, they were never going to hit a terabyte of data, right? And now it's right, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, we passed that three years ago. <laughs> it's long gone. It's way in the rearview mirror. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, so with that, you you mentioned automation a couple of times. So, um, how do you see that the role and the importance of automation in doing these data ops type processes? And, and what do you think about uh, you know are are we moving towards maybe some AI driven automation to really address this scale thing? Yeah, no, I think, you know, automation, I mean, generally it's, it's, it's a key part of data ops in, in our view, you know, it's, it's a fundamental aspect. And, it, and I think it's particularly essential if you look at data observability in, in particular, um, you know, you know if, if organizations are focused on automating the monitoring of all that data, we just talked about, you know, the volumes of data, the number of users, and you have to assess the health of that data, you know, based on, how, you know, however many attributes across, you know, things like freshness, distribution, volume, schema, schema and then tracking the lineage, you know, it, that's just beyond the realms of, you know, humans being able to, to track all that in a, in a in a particularly in a continuous manner, so I think you know the the use of automation expands the volume of data that that can be monitored, but it also helps you know improve the efficiency compared to sort of you know more more manual sort of data monitoring and management, in terms of things like applying data quality checks and and then you know recommending uh, actions and that's where we get into you know machine learning um, and and even uh, potentially some sort of uh, you know we do see some early uh, experiments in terms of generative AI as well, in terms of d- data preparation, data tagging uh, as well for data quality. So, um, yeah, I think the use of machine learning to automate the monitoring of data is being integrated into data observability as well as data quality tools and platforms. Um, and, you know, that is, 
you know that's only going to continue and it's all it, it because it is essential to 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 be able to automate that level of of data to ensure that it's you know things like it's complete it's valid it is consistent and relevant and free from duplication it's just yeah the volumes we're talking about the scale we're talking about it's just beyond uh the, the realms of having humans do that in you know on a on a continuous basis yeah and, and i think when we start talking about things like ai and generative ai um the I think the the risk factor goes up quite a bit on, you know, are you using good quality data? Is the has the PII data and the PHI data been yeah. tagged and managed appropriately? So, um, you know, things that we've always been concerned with in data warehousing, like lineage, becomes even more important because if you're going to verify all this, so. Um, yeah. Would you think of this to a certain extent as a um, important for risk mitigation by implementing oh, absolutely. data ops? Yeah, no, definitely. And I think, you know, when, you know, obviously we've seen a huge amount of um, excitement and interest in generative AI in the, you know, throughout the year. And uh, there's been points when I sort of thought like, it's, it's you know, <laughs> are people not going to be focused on like the inputs and the data and the trusting the outputs and the reliability because, you know, obviously there's, you know, it's, don't get me wrong, it's, you know, incredible what we can do with generative AI, but you can, obviously it can be incredibly wrong as we all know. And I think, you know, people talk yeah. a lot about generative AI democratizing access to data, which clearly it does um, through, you know, through natural language interfaces, but it, it places even more importance on the ability to verify the outputs of, of the models. You know, is that yeah. data point or that stem, is that correct? Was that in the underlying data? And, and as you say, was the underlying data of high enough quality and, uh, it, you know, could be, be trusted in the first place? And was there data in there that there shouldn't be in terms of privacy and reliability? So, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, even more important than ever <laughs> to, yeah, to yeah. be able to trust your data. Right. Yeah. Because I, I think that that's the uh, that question of do we trust the data, the input data yeah, becomes even more important. I mean, it's always kind of been there and we've had all the battles over data quality. It was we mostly said data quality. Right. It's like, oh, it's yes. low quality data. So, yeah, the projections may or may not be great. But now if you're you know, democratizing access to that data with generative AI and people are potentially drawing conclusions from it and things like chat GPT are, are writing reports, right. Yeah. And summarizing that data, you know, without something like data ops and the observability and the monitoring being automated, you know, how, how in the world would we know that we, that the data that went into that really was valid from that particular perspective that, it, you know, Absolutely, that it's yeah. the, the right kind of data and that it's trusted. And I think that question we have now of do you, you know, to the business folks in particular, do you trust the data that was used to make this decision, especially if it's going through some sort of gen, gen AI black box, right? Yeah. You can look at the output, but then we got to be able to trace that input. So that's, I think you, you mentioned that data lineage, right? That's even yeah. more important. Yeah. yeah. And I think especially because, you know, the, 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 these applications are so advanced and have this appearance of, you know, genuine conscious intelligence that right. it's easy, as you say, for, you know, not wanting to, well, you know, business users don't necessarily need to think about in their day to day, you know, can this be trusted if they're presented with something which is a, a an amazing report that looks great and looks, you know, like it's the the result of an intelligent uh, process. Um, there will be an assumption that the underlying data is correct, and and I think you know it's obviously that puts greater emphasis on you know data management uh, uh, professionals to ensure that that is in fact the case and that these users can trust in those in the output and and get ahead and make their business decisions based on it rather than having to go back and check and verify everything and and second guess you know whether something is is real or a hallucination yeah so i think from uh, yeah from that perspective you know as you know data management professionals yeah, the business may be just accepting it at face value, but if there's a compliance issue or a question or an audit, we have to be prepared to show exactly what happened. 
and show, yeah. yes, that was trusted data and have that lineage all the way back to the source with all the transformations and everything else that happened in there and whatever business rules were applied to be able to very quickly and effectively show that, you know, when, when called upon. And I guess that's, that's where the data ops automation comes in is to be able to do that. Yeah. Cause he said, if it's, if you got 500 engineers writing manual code, well, you know that that's, that's a, that's going to be a nightmare to figure out where did that one little thing come from and did something go wrong because it was coded wrong without yeah. having some sort of um, framework to do that with, right? Yeah, no, exactly. As you say, in terms of the speed and the scale, but also the, you know, the tools to have the, you know, the, the, the change tracking and yeah, to be able to actually identify, yes, this changed at that point and this is how and why and who, who was responsible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's a little bit more on, you know, what do you think are some of the considerations that buyers should be keeping in mind when they're looking at these tools? You know, when we got into the cloud world, we saw a lot of what I called cloud washing with legacy right. products that were suddenly rebranded as being cloud, uh, maybe born in the cloud or moved to the cloud or cloudified or something. Um, you know, do we need to be concerned about the same kind of creative rebranding of legacy data management tools in this space that they all of a sudden become, oh, we're, we're a data ops tool. Yeah, I think that there's definitely some of that, I'd say data ops washing going on and or, or, and also sort of different definitions of data ops. I think, you know, obviously, as you said, data ops has been around for a long time. People have been involved with data ops for a long time. You know, look at the data ops manifesto and the seven pillars you talked, you know, and they, they have a clear understanding of what that means. I think we also saw another use of the term data ops which just gen refers to sort of data management rebranded and i think you have to be careful uh, you know as i said when we looked at the the when we we were very clear in terms of the the capabilities we were looking at that they should the products we were evaluating should match the kind of capabilities that that you know are, are listed in the, the the pillars and and the data ops manifesto um you know, as we we do see, obviously, data integration tools being rebranded as data orchestration platforms, data quality tools being rebranded as data observability, um, and yeah, as I said, we we would try to be careful around that. And um, yeah, I won't name names, but it was it, what did kind of amuse me. There was one when it, in identifying vendors for inclusion, we came across one product in particular which had been rebranded as a and was being positioned as, as a data observability product. And one of the things we do in this process is we go and look at the documentation and we, you know, we, we assess the documentation. When I looked at that, it's like, well, this doesn't actually appear, the documentation hasn't changed. It's just the name has changed. <laughs> and we actually went back to the, to the vendor to clarify, do you, do you want to be included in this or not? And they actually said, no, we're, that's not us. We're not, data, you know, we're not data observability as you're defining it. But they still have data observability on the product name. So, you know, it's definitely... But it you know, probably didn't say observability anywhere in the documentation. No, it wasn't. Exactly. It was, it was not in there. It was, it was integration. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yes, definitely, you know, for, for, you know for, for potential buyers, you know, you've got to examine, you know, the, the core functionality of the products in terms of, you know, can it, is it capable of doing X, Y, and, and Z? But also I think, you know, things like automated testing, change control, collaboration, continuous delivery, all of those aspects that, that are part of data ops aren't necessarily, part, you know, um, covered by products that are being positioned as part of the data ops um, umbrella. So yes, I would, you know, I, I think you'd, be very careful and cautious to think about what what do, as a as a potential buyer what are you looking for in a data ops tool why are you looking for data ops tool in particular and you know and make sure that those capabilities are a part of any evaluation in addition to you know just the the the, the core functionality of of the uh, of the, the technology itself yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's yeah. So like always, it's buyer beware, right? Don't necessarily believe the the, the marketing hype around a product, yeah. especially if it's uh, a company that's been around and predates the data ops world. Then you know, look at that with some level of scrutiny. And of course, that's where your your buyer's guide is 
Um, I'm sure it will be very helpful to people because you've got some clear criteria in there. So even if it's not one of the tools that you cover in the buyer's guide, that still gives people a framework of what are the right questions to be asking, right? Yeah, well, hopefully that, I mean, that is that is what the, the, the buyer's guides are designed to address. Obviously, we do our own evaluation of the, the various products that, that, that meet the inclusion criteria. But yes, in theory, a, a, a you know, a an organization could, uh, take uh, the buyer's guide uh, scoring criteria and, and you know use it as it is or adapt it or and 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 go from there. So yeah, it definitely is designed to serve that kind of purpose too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for somebody doing a you know like you said mentioned early uh, RFP or RFI type of investigation and they want to evaluate a number of uh, of options. But they, this gives them a bit of a framework to, to do it with. And yeah. you know, like you said, you've looked at the Data Ops Manifesto and the seven pillars of true data ops. So that's kind of been you know, kind of incorporated into the thinking already. Um, mm-hmm. And then the, the bigger one, though, is your, your point is like, as an organization, you have to decide what is it we're really looking for? You know, yeah. would it, how do they define data ops? Do they agree with how we've all defined data ops? Um, I know many organizations early on, they, they just kept, they got really hooked on, uh, we need CICD. Okay, yeah. Great. But what about all the rest of this, right? They just, they, and what they were really looking for is, you know, how, how can we do better version control? And, you know, they're trying to manage their agile sprints and, and, and do some sort of continuous integration there. Uh, but they, they hadn't thought about, oh, what about automated testing and monitoring and, um, you know, componentizing things, containerizing things, and all of that sort of thing. They just said, oh, we just want to CICD. And then if you do that, you search on CICD, well, you're going to find some of the traditional yeah. DevOps tools, which may or may not be appropriate, um, you know, depending on the environment you're building, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. So um, any any other advice for folks getting started with data ops? Yeah, and I think, you know, it, you kind of touched on it there. Uh, you know, obviously, the, the whole point of the bias guide is it, it is focused on evaluating products and technology. But I think, you know, we also see that data ops, as, as we've talked about here, it does involve the change of mindset in addition to that technology. So I think in organizations need to be thinking also about not just you know the tools, but also their processes, their methodologies. Are they are they organised to support agile and collaborative processes? Things like continuous delivery, uh, reproducibility, process simplification, and measurable improvement as well. You know, it's not. I think that's part of data ops. It's not just a matter of let's say doing things more efficiently. It's being able to prove you're doing things more efficiently, and and actually right. the the data engineering and data management team being able to articulate the value that they are providing to the to the business as well. I think that is an important part. As you say, but some organisations that be more important than others, and you can sort of dial the the uh, the gauges up and down in terms of the scoring, but uh, depending on what's more important to you. But I think yeah, the the, the process and methodologies um, need need to be taken into account definitely. Yeah, so that's definitely that's the people, processes, technology question. Is what's yeah. the, what's what's the what do you think is the biggest barrier for success in this area for folks? Well, I mean, generally, I think you know, we see time and time again that people is the biggest barrier to to change <laughs> and, and success with any new initiative, you know, anywhere because it doesn't matter how your how good your technology is if if people don't want to or are reluctant to to use it. Um, and this is particularly true, obviously, when we said earlier about organizations trying to be more data driven and encourage more self-service access. You know, you need to bring people along with you on, on that, you know, with three things like data culture and data literacy and data democratization initiatives. Um, but, you know, so I, I think I'd go with people. But that said, obviously, I just was talking about processes. The processes also need to evolve. So, um, right. yeah, I think you, you need the it is a definitely a combination of the people, the process, and the technology to actually enable the people to make best use of the technology within the organization. Yeah, great. So um, is it time to close out here? Uh, where can people find this uh, report and uh, keep up with what you're doing at Ventana? Yeah, so I think we got the, the QR code here, for, which will take you specifically to, to the, uh, the report itself. Um, and, um, you know, I should note that, like, on a, 
other analyst firms, we don't actually charge for our written research. So um, if you go to that link there, you do have to fill out a form, but um, the, the, the report is freely available to anybody, uh, be there, you know, a vendor or, or an enterprise. Um, and, and also if you go to, well, you can find your way from there, but ventanaresearch.com slash data, you can find all the, the details of our latest research on the data you know, sector of the market specifically. And also you can sign up there to subscribe to our latest uh, analyst perspectives, which again are, are available free of charge. Um, just have to fill in your details and, and subscribe to that. So, you know, we uh, we, we have a, a growing, uh, you know, large and growing community of, of end users and obviously on the, the vendor side as well. And we're always uh, glad to, to welcome more people into that. Great. All right. Well, thanks for that, Matt. And uh, thank, thanks for being a guest on the show today. Uh, appreciate you coming on and, uh, and discussing the report. It's uh, really exciting that, you know, the data ops world has evolved to the point that now there's a buyer's guide. <laughs> that's, Absolutely, pretty, yeah. that's pretty exciting, really. That, you know, and people have needed it. So I, I think that's going to be right. very helpful. Um, you know, thanks to everyone else who's uh, joining us today or watching the replay. Uh, be sure to join us again in two weeks when my guest is going to be a guy who's actually interviewed me more times than I can even remember. He's a podcaster, radio host, and uh, industry know-it-all, Eric Cavanaugh. He's the CEO of the Blur Group and a longtime host of DM Radio, which is the longest running show in the world of data. So that's going to be a really fun talk with him in, uh, in two weeks. So also be sure to like the replays on our podcast here and tell all your friends about the True Data Ops podcast. And don't forget to go to truedataops.org and subscribe so that you don't miss any of our future episodes. So until next time, this is Kent Graziano, the Data Warrior, signing off for now.